Hello everyone and welcome to this course on modern application development. So before getting to the different types of databases, it's worth spending a little bit of time understanding how data search works. Okay. And one of the things that I will be using over here is something called the big O notation, right? So this, you might have come across this kind of notation over here, O and followed by parenthesis, right? And in computer science, in theoretical computer science, this is sometimes referred to as the big O notation, right? Big O because there are also corresponding small O and a couple of other different variants of this. The big O is what is most commonly used, right? And it roughly means order of magnitude, okay? So what we are trying to convey when we use big O notation is the order of complexity of the computation that you are trying to perform, okay? Now, without going into any details on big O notation or how it is used in practice, right? you will need to do a proper course on algorithms to understand that. And hopefully most of you have either already done it or will be doing it at some point. Uh, over here, I'm only going to touch upon some of the very basic concepts that we need for understanding some things over here. Right? And the things to keep in mind are, one of them is O of 1 essentially means constant time, right, independent of the input size. So in other words, if I have, let's say, records of 1 million users stored somewhere in a database, but if I make a query about something, right, I don't know what, but if I make some kind of a query and I'm able to get back a response in O of 1 time or constant time, that's excellent, right? What it means is that the time required to respond did not depend on the number of users or the number of entries in the database, right? That's sort of the best case scenario. You can't really hope for anything better than that, okay? But it's also unrealistic because, you know, anything which returns an answer independent of the number of entries that are there in the database can't really be doing very useful work, okay? Because it's clearly not even looking at the data in some way. Now, the next best in some ways is what's called O of log n, right? And when we say O of log n, what we are saying is that if I have n records sitting inside my database, right, I am able to, let's say, retrieve one of them in log n number of steps or at least some constant times log n number of steps, okay? Which means that if the database grows in size, it grows up by a factor of, let's say, 10 times, right? The time taken to answer my query only goes up by a small increment. It doesn't go up 10 times in particular. Okay, so if the data, the number of data entries goes up by a factor of 10, the time does not go up by a factor of 10. It goes up by something much less. Okay, this is also very good. I mean, this is pretty much the best that you can hope for in practical scenarios. Okay, O of n is sort of the obvious thing, right? If I have a million entries, then, you know, how do I find one entry over there? I search through each one until I hit the entry that I'm looking for. Okay, so that's sort of the simple solution in most cases. In many instances, O of n is probably good enough, but not for things like database search. Okay. After that, we have the big O's that are worse than O of n, right? You can have O of n power k, where if k is 2, you would call it O of n square, which is quadratic. If k is 3, you would have O of n cubed, cubic, and so on, right? These are not particularly good. It means that the time required for performing an operation grows rapidly compared to the increase in size of the data itself. But even then is not as bad as O of k power n, right? Which is what we call exponential, okay? And exponential is very bad, meaning that even for relatively small values of n, it's not going to work very well. Imagine that k was equal to two, right? What it means is that for every one unit increase in n, that is for every record that you have added into the whatever your uh, data store is, the time required for performing the operation is doubling. Okay, just add one more entry and now you have to do double the amount of work. Okay, so clearly this is very bad. There are problems where the algorithms, best algorithms known are even worse than exponential. You can basically go to factorial and other functions, but we don't even consider those, right? I mean, there's no point in really looking at those kind of algorithms. So clearly, we would like to see whether we can get to things which are O of 1 or O of log n, at worst O of n, okay? 
So with that in mind, let's look at how we would actually search for an element in memory, right? And let's assume that somehow the data which I need has been stored in memory using some kind of a linked list, okay? And what I mean by a linked list is there is some data over here, A, and that has a pointer to the next element, B, that in turn points to the next element, C, and so on until I hit uh, the end of the link, uh, end of the chain, okay? So now how do I search for B over here? I start from A, move on down the line, go to B, I've hit the correct entry, right? I come back. If I want to search for C, I would need to go through A, then to B, then to C and stop, okay? Clearly, right, this algorithm is order of N in terms of the runtime because in the worst case, I would need to go through all N elements in order to get to the final result, right? In the average, right, if I don't know which one I'm searching for to start with, I can sort of expect that, you know, it's probably going to be somewhere in the middle and the time taken is going to be n by 2, which is O of n, right? Remember that O of n is only order of magnitude, so any such by 2 and such constants are ignored, okay? It's still proportional to n, that's all that we care about. So in terms of database searching, not particularly good, right? Why? Because typically you would have to search many times in a database and as the size of the database grows, if each of those searches is going to take time proportional to the number of elements, you might run into serious problems after some time, okay? Now, what if this data was sitting in an array instead, right? So it's an array in memory. What's the main difference? I know that the first element is stored here, the second element is stored here, the third element is stored here and so on, which means that if I need to access, let's say X of I, I can directly jump to that location, okay? The problem is, I don't know what I is. I don't know which location to jump to, right? And so I still have to start from here, then go to the next element, then go to the next element until I finally hit the thing that I was searching for, which means that because the data in the array was not sorted, I had to start from the beginning and go step by step. And therefore the time remains O of N, okay? On the other hand, what if I had data in an array that I have guaranteed somehow is actually sorted, okay? What I mean by sorted is basically that I guarantee that A is less than B is less than C, right? That the entries sitting inside this array satisfy some kind of a comparison property, okay? And what do I do with this comparison property? I can basically say that now, I will start by looking over here, right? So this is the first comparison, right? And let's say that I'm searching for D or let's say I'm searching for the letter P, okay? So what happens over here is the first one that I hit is midway through, which let's say is M, okay? I know that because M is less than P, therefore it can't be in the first half. I can basically rule out half the elements from the search, okay? So now I again go and look at the second half, okay? So basically I'm going to look at element, well, you know, from 14 to 26, if I assume that we have, then basically I'm going to look at element number 20, right? Which would probably be element T, okay? And then after iterating some few times, I would finally end up at P, not N but let's say some k steps, okay? Now, what did we actually do over here? Since I had this comparison, right, the less than property that I could check, I could straight away eliminate sort of large chunks of this memory, right? And basically say, okay, you know, after the first step, this first half is eliminated. After the second step, the second quarter is eliminated, right? Which means that at each stage, I'm going n to n by two, to n by 4, right? At what point does it become equal to 1? Okay. And if you think about it, basically what this is saying is that this k is basically going to be log to base 2 of n, the ceiling of that, right? I mean, it has to be an integer number. So the smallest integer that's greater than this log n to base 2, 
okay, that is all that you really need in order to reduce the number of elements in your array to 1. Okay. Perfect. So, what we have over here is we can actually bring this entire thing down right, from an O of n search to something which basically finishes in O of log n. Right? And this is something called binary search. and is very commonly used in various kinds of search optimizations. So what we can see is that you know if you were somehow able to store data in some form that is sorted and has some kind of comparison functions and easy ways to access locations, you can actually do searching within O of log n steps. Okay? Something to keep in mind when we start looking at actual databases. Now, arrays by themselves have certain problems right i mean the biggest problem with it is you need to fix the size of the array ahead of time right adding new entries is a problem i need to resize the whole array deleting an entry is also a problem because then i need to push everything back up right i need to keep the size of the array fixed otherwise there's no point right i lose all the benefits of this sorting that i was talking about so because of that there are alternatives that have been proposed right and once again you know, you would have probably come across all this in the data structures and algorithms course, right? Uh, binary search tree is a good way of solving this problem, right? It's a nice efficient way of maintaining a sorted order, right? Essentially, we have something called a root and it has the property that everything over here is less than the root, everything over here is greater than the root, okay? And similarly, I could have like multiple branches over here. Once again, this would be less than, this would be greater than, but only greater than whatever element is its immediate parent. Okay, not greater than the root itself. It cannot be. Just because it's on the left hand side of the root guarantees that this element is less than the root. But because it's on the right hand side of its immediate parent, it means it is greater than that parent. Okay. So in this way, we build up some kind of a tree structure, right? And it turns out that this binary search that we talked about works brilliantly on this as well. Okay. Now, there is a problem with binary trees. Once again, I am not getting into details because it is out of scope of this course. Right? The problem is so called balancing. Trees very quickly get unbalanced. Right? Problem can be solved. Right? There are so called red black trees, AVL trees and various other kinds of things. Uh, in particular, there is a whole set of structures called B trees. Right? which not only allow you to build efficient binary trees, but are also friendly to storing data on storage mechanisms such as disk. Right? All the other data structures that we talk about generally, assume that you have RAM, random access memory, and that that is where you are really storing the data. B trees, on the other hand, actually explicitly take into account the fact that you might be storing data on some other kind of storage mechanism. And what is the important part? The disk means that you will only be able to retrieve or uh, write data in chunks of some size. At least that is when it becomes efficient. Okay? So, B trees are sort of built around that whole idea that they are supposed to be disk friendly while at the same time having many of the benefits of uh, you know, efficient data storage and retrieval. Okay? There is also something else called a hash table. right? And a hash table once again, you would probably come across this in the data structures course, but the bottom line is that, you know, if you have some kind of a magic function, which can take whatever you are searching for and instantly compute an index for it, a number, right? And let's say that your storage mechanism was to say that whatever number I get out of that hash, I will use that as the index in memory where I'm going to store this particular element, right? If I can do that, and it's a big if in some cases, you can actually do searching in unit time, right? Constant time, O of one, right? Because all you need to do is compute the hash of whatever you are searching for. Go check that memory location. Either it's there or it's not there. Okay. So in the cases where you can do it, at least, or you can do it efficiently, it turns out that nothing can really beat this. Okay. But it's not always applicable. There are certain specific conditions where it can be used.